Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. And let's uh, just begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, as we come together this morning, virtually again, uh, Lord, I continue to pray for um, our service. I continue to pray for the word that you've laid on my heart. And Lord, I lift up uh, my extended family in Prince Edward Island who are suffering the loss of Cheryl. Lord, I pray that you would just reach out to uh, that family. I pray for you. Pray that you would be with all those who are suffering loss and those who are ill. Um, just uh, help us. Uh, someone said, I've had enough of this pandemic. <laughs> it's time. So Lord, I uh, just pray your blessing over the pandemic and all that that has brought into our lives and all the changes that it has caused. Uh, just bless uh, those people who are trying to guide and direct us through this, Lord. And may we just lay it all in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I am preaching from 1 Peter, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And um, <clears throat> I'm preaching out of the New Living Translation because uh, I just like the simplicity of how it says it. So uh, beginning at uh, verse 1, it says, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your, chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. So today I want to talk about the past and the future. Uh, past us, future us. And, and I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on the past. And, and here's my reason why. I, I find when people give testimonies, uh, I see this pattern where uh, someone will be asked to give their testimony and uh, say they're given uh, 20 minutes or uh, half an hour, but let's just say 20 minutes. They're given 20 minutes to give their testimony and, and we tend to spend 15 minutes on who we were. <laughs> And really, that's not the important part. Uh, I don't need to know how bad your life was uh, or how bad you were in your life. Uh, what I want to hear in a testimony is I want to hear what God's doing with you now. But for this sermon, we do have to talk a little bit about our past, who we were there, but I don't want to spend too much time there. I want to talk about the contrast between the two different lifestyles, uh, who we were and who we are. Um, we start off... Uh, in our scripture, it starts off with the words, so then. Uh, and whenever, uh, you, if you know me and if you've been following us online, you know that when a verse of scripture starts off like that with me, it, it automatically says to me, we've got to back up. Because it says, so then, meaning back up. Peter has been going into great depths uh, throughout chapter 3 of uh, 1 Peter, explaining how Jesus, who lived a sinful life, suffered for the sins of man, and how it is better to suffer for doing good than it is to suffer for doing wrong. So, um, so then is how he starts it, and that explains why. But it says, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. So, so Christ suffered this physical pain. When they say this it, it is the complete understanding that he did it by choice. Th they didn't sneak up on him and jump on him and hold him down and whip him. And he, he did this willingly. Uh, we hear that in the trial. I, I lay down my life and because I lay it down, I have the authority to pick it back up again. And, and, he, and he tells Pontius, you have no authority over me that didn't come from my father in heaven. Uh, th this was part of the plan. We need to have, and we need to have the same attitude to, to understand that we may suffer because of our faith, that we may have to endure suffering for the needs of others. Um, whether uh, 
whether they accept that we are doing this for them or not. Uh, we, we can't hold a grudge to say, you know, you don't know what I went through to, to bring you the gospel. That's not the important part. The important part is you brought them the gospel and you were willing to do so. And he says in the latter part of that, that verse, he says, the last part of it, he says, if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. And, and I think that's, that's interesting. And, and I like the way that it said it in the New Living Translation. And that's why I kind of chose that translation because I believe... Um, we did a Bible study this week, and it was talking about stuff, and, and I, I, things got complicated during the, because we're doing everything online, and, and uh, our teacher, uh, his internet wasn't working, so my wife was teaching because I was in a different meeting with a district function, and so I came into it later, but she had my book, and I'd written answers, and she didn't read this answer, and I'm glad she didn't, but we were talking about stuff, uh, the definition of sin or, or, or what, what is the cause of sin, and you see, I believe that sin is always self-centered, right? Uh, 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 that's what I believe. And, and I believe the contrast is holiness is always God-centered. So, so who was I before? I, I was self-centered. I was, I was, I was sinful. I, I, everything I was doing was based on my gain or my desire or my want or, or what I thought was my need. And now uh, living for God, living for Christ... My, my focus is God-centered. So, so to recap that, I always think that sin is self-centered and, and, and sinful, self-centered, uh, self-centered sinfulness, and holiness is always God-centered. And, and I think verse 2 kind of explains that very well. It says, you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious, and I like that word, you will be anxious to do the will of God. You'll be excited about doing the will of God. Before, all you wanted to do is to do what you wanted to do, to gain for yourself, self-centeredness. You, you were focused on you and what would make you happy and what would please you. And now you are anxious to do the will of God. You won't spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires. And I, and I think that's that's a great way of looking at it. In verse 3, it says, You have had enough of the past and the evil things that godless people enjoy. You've had enough. You, you, you come to a point where you say, I don't need this anymore. This is, this is not who I am. I have made this connection with God, and now my heart's desire, because God has changed my heart, my heart's desire is not to seek that, to not chase that, to not desire that, but I've had enough of that. My desire is to move forward. And, and what he defines what that, that uh, evil things that godless people enjoy, and, and he gives this little list, uh, immorality and lust, feasting, drunkenness, wild parties, uh, and the terrible worship of idols. And, and my biggest idol was me. My biggest idol was me, because if I look at the, the way I'm defining sin as self-centeredness, I have to say that my biggest desire was me, self uh, and I think that's what Paul's talking about when Paul talks about the old man, that sinful nature, that, that part of me. In verse 4, we find some of the stuff that is hard to deal with when you become a new Christian. I, I remember, I think back on my life, and, and, and you know, I'm a first-generation Christian in my family. Um, I came into this church, uh, actually came to faith in this church, but when I came, I, I kind of stepped out of the family mold. Uh, you know, a family of th three boys and a girl and a father and mother and, 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 you know, Irish background. And I used to say we would rather fight than eat. Uh, we would rather drink than eat. Uh, that was my life. And, and I kind of stepped out of that. But it says in verse 4, it kind of talks about one of the hardest things that I found in that transition period. When I started coming to church and, and, and my conversion was not a, a quick thing. I didn't, I didn't walk into the church day one and get struck by lightning and accept Christ and, and be all excited about it and leave. It was a gradual thing that I had a lot of questions and uh, took a lot of time, a couple years before I actually came to this faith and this understanding and wanting to surrender my life to God. But it says, of course your former friends are surprised. And man, were my friends surprised. Um, people were asking me, what happened to you? Uh, and, and to be quite honest, I didn't really have an answer that, um, I mean, I had an answer, but I couldn't explain it well. And I finally came 
to this conclusion. This is my answer even to this day. People say, what happened to you? And, and I say, I came to a place where I had to believe in something bigger than myself. Like, because they're wanting to know what caused me to. And, and it gets complicated to explain, you know, prevenient grace to a non-believer and explain that God touched my heart and they don't understand what that means and it sounds weird to them and they get all weird and they stop talking to you. And, but they're surprised and so they ask what happened. And, and so I have found over the years that that answer has helped keep the door open at least. I just say, I came to a place where I had to believe in something bigger than myself. And, and so then I found God, or God found me. Uh, God was not missing, right? So it says, of course, your former friends were surprised. My friends were all surprised. I remember going to a 25-year high school reunion, and my friends were shocked to hear, what, so what are you doing now? And I remember uh, helping out at the local high school in the drama club. They asked if I, was, if I would come and help build some, some sets for the stage, they were doing this drama and I was building backgrounds and, and one of the, my former teachers who of course, you know, we're talking 30 years, 40 years ago, didn't recognize me and asked someone and I could hear it in the wings and they said, who is that? And this person that I was helping build the sets, it was his job, he said, he, she told him it's Randy Barrington and, and she goes, he's not in prison. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, 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 it's a natural thing for your friends to be surprised. And they are surprised, at, this verse says, when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. I did wild and destructive things. That was the motto of my life. That, that was the way I lived. I, I remember reading uh, just a few years ago, they were talking about these kids that were doing car surfing. And, and you think, this is, this is crazy. I, that's something I did years ago down auto route 20 my buddy was driving as fast as he could and i was standing right on the roof of the car i'm superman i'm an idiot is what i should have been yelling but anyway i was doing destructive things i was doing destructive things physically for myself i was doing destructive things emotionally for myself and spiritually for myself i was not the father i should be i was not the husband i should be i was not the friend i should be everything i was doing had this form of destructive behavior at the baseline why? Because it was steeped in sin. It was self-centered. I was only worried about me. And he says, so, so of course they're surprised because you're not doing the destructive things that you used to do. And it says, so they slander you. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to say that. I don't mean to judge anybody in that. When people don't understand, they think it's crazy. And I have to confess something. My sister-in-law came to faith before any of us did. My wife's sister, and she started coming to church. And I remember the conversations when she was not around. And, you know, oh, she's, she's a, a Jesus freak. She's a Bible thumper. She got saved with a giggle in the voices. And you know what? I regret every minute of it. And I remember this one conversation I found myself defending her even though I didn't know what I was defending. And I, I, and I guess that's, that was part of prevenient grace where God was just starting to work on my heart and it was not a long time later that we started going to church. Uh, but, but they slander you. They, they talk about you behind your back. And that's, that's part of the suffering. And that can cause uh, an emotional suffering and it can be a physical thing. Emotional suffering can cause physical pain. So, so this is what's happening in here. And then in verse 5 it says, But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge uh, everyone, both living and the dead. And when they say they will have to face God, we should not be happy about that. <laughs> this should not please us. To, to, to think about that. It's like, well, they're talking about me behind my back, but one day they're going to stand before God and he's going to set them straight. You know what? One day God's going to set us all straight. We will all stand before God. So if you're perfect and you know you're perfect, okay. I mean, I'm not worried about meeting God, but I know that there are things that I'm going to answer to. And, and I've said this many times in my sermons that I don't think that when I stand before God, that the question is going to be, 
why were you not more like so-and-so? And why were you not more like so-and-so? But I do think one of the questions is going to be, why weren't you the Randy I planned you to be? And I think we're all going to answer that question one day. So, so when I think about my, my friends who don't understand me because I'm not doing what they want to do, and they don't understand why because they're still steeped in that, and they're still living that, and all of a sudden one of their buddies is not doing it anymore, they don't understand. They start talking behind my back, I, I, or behind your back, and they're going to face God for that. I don't think it's something that should bring us any joy. I can remember one of the situations where this happened. I stopped drinking. Um, I like to drink. I, 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 I could go months and months and months without drinking, and, and that's just a culture that I grew up in. Sunday afternoons at my parents' house, we sat there and got drunk. We sat around the table and smoked cigarettes and life was a joke and, and we argued and we drank and we got drunk. And I remember when I stopped that, uh, I was a volunteer fireman for over 30 years and I remember they did a fireman Olympics and I was part of that team and we won and we won a certain amount of money and there was a big dance going on later and there was a bar and so the, the, the person that was the captain of the team that year took the money and said, well, what are you guys drinking? And I said, Pepsi. And he looked at me and he said, Pepsi? And I said, yeah, I don't drink anymore. And he, and he said, he looked at his watch and he goes, till when? He was surprised. He was shocked. So they don't understand it. They, they, they don't understand that God has touched your heart. They don't know what that feels like. So we should not look at the fact that they will have to face God with joy, but with sadness. We will all have to face God and give an account. So in verse 6, that is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So, and, I, and I, I, I know that's only part of the scripture, but I want to read something uh, that, that I found in, in a uh, commentary that I think it's pretty interesting. It says, the interpretation of the verse is often linked to uh, chapter 3, verse 19, but the vocabulary of the text differ. There are four main things that they believe uh, the word dead in this passage means, okay? The first one was that Christ, while in his uh, three-day death period, went and preached salvation to all the dead, offering salvation to those who lived pre-Christian times. That's, that's one belief. The second one was, while Christ was in his three-day death, he went and preached salvation to just the Old Testament people. A third one is, the apostles and others uh, on this earth preached the gospel to those who were spiritually dead. And the fourth one says, the dead are Christians who had the gospel preached to them and who had died or had been put to death through their faith. And I, and I kind of like the fourth one. And, and for this reason, it points ahead to the rest of the sentence, okay, then instead of looking back. The coming judgment will not only bring sinners into account, but will also reverse the judgments of the human beings. The good news had been proclaimed to those Christians who are now dead. Uh, they had been martyred. And even though pagans might condemn Christians and put them to death on this realm, on the realm of flesh, yet in God's judgment there will be a reversal. The Christians will live in a new realm, the spiritual realm. So, so I think it also agrees with the last part of the verse. The last part of verse 6 says, So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. So, so there's some questions that we need to ask ourselves in all of this. The first one is, so, so, so how are we living how are we living our lives? What, what is the center of our lives? Is our, the center of our life self, or is the center of our life God? Are, are, you, are we chasing our own tail in search of happiness that is all wrapped up in this self, selfish, self-centered desire? Are we living a life, or are we living a life for God that is wrapped up in love for others? and focused on the desires that none should be lost. To live a life of love, 
a love for others, a love for God, and a love for the lost. I'd like to read, in conclusion, I'd like to read two verses, or two, two sections of Scripture. The first one is the next two verses in what we just preached about. Verses 7 and 8. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 say this. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. And the last part of Scripture is, is a, a verse of Scripture that we have heard so many times. It is a verse of Scripture that I read at just about every wedding that I do. It is the verse of Scripture where Paul defines what love means. 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to read it slowly, and I'm going to just close with that. Because if we're looking at loving the lost and loving people and loving to do God's will, listen to these words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging bell. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For we, know, we now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Read that every day this week. Think about how that little parcel of Scripture can affect your life. Think of how that little parsage, uh, parcel of Scripture could be a driving force that pushes us out into, into loving this world the way God wants us to love this world. Dear Heavenly Father, Help us to live this scripture in this world that is just spinning out of control. Help us to be loved to people. Help us to encourage and bless and support people. Guide us through this week, Lord, and through the rest of our lives, showing us where your love needs to be applied to that wound. And help us to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody.